Well, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Psalm chapter 19 tonight. Psalm chapter 19. Kind of a little uh, familiar parts of this psalm. I think it'll be uh, an interesting help for us because there's some things that happens in this psalm that even I, even though I've known this psalm, to begin to study, uh, the Lord brought some, some truths out here that I thought was, were especially helpful to me. In Psalm chapter 19, probably the most familiar, the verses in Psalm chapter 19 are the first two verses, followed by the end of the chapter. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech, nor language where their voice is not heard. Let's go, Lord, in prayers to begin the service tonight. Lord, I thank you uh, for the time that we have to look at your word. Lord, I thank you for the freedom that you've allowed us to possess here in America where we can, without fear of retribution, worship you. And Lord, we can open your word and not worry about the consequences. And Lord, thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that tonight as we open your word and look at your truth that you would touch us. Lord, it seems if there's some elements that would hope to distract us tonight in the service, and I pray there'd be no more distractions in the service. Well, that every element would work just like it ought to work so that your word would go forth with nothing hindering it. Lord, move us, speak to us, and change us tonight. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. First part of that verse, there we find these words, declare the glory of God. The Bible begins in this chapter, Psalm chapter 19, a psalm of David, uh, to speak about God's glory. Tonight I want to challenge us on this aspect, uh, the glory of God, his magnificence. The glory of God is his worth. The glory of God is his loveliness. The glory of God is the grandeur of his many perfections. You know, you understand that everything that God does is perfect. It is not done halfway from the first moments of creation when God uttered the words, let there be. Everything that was done was done perfectly. All of creation was done without imperfection. And any imperfection has been because of sin in this sin now cursed world. But everything that God does is perfect. And it is these perfections that point us back to the glory of God. In Scripture, we find out the glory of God is often revealed in brightness, in a shining uh, example. In fact, when Moses interacted with God, God did not let Moses see his face, but he let Moses see the back part as he went past in his glory. Moses was so affected by this interaction that his face radiated the glory of God. And there was so much of this brightness that was revealed off Moses' face that the children of Israel could not look at Moses and said, Moses, put a veil over your face. And Moses merely, like, reflected the glory. God's glory is powerful. God's glory is magnificent. And I'm afraid that often that we do not reflect upon the glory of God. We reflect upon his work and we reflect upon our needs that we want him to fulfill. But to reflect and to revel, to praise inside of his absolute perfection. And the Bible says here in Psalm chapter 19 that the heavens, the earth, everything that is done shows the glory of God. Verse number two, it says, there is no speech nor language. There is no place on this planet that you can go and not see the magnificence, the perfection the grandeur of God's glory. From the highest mountaintop peak to the lowest valley in the sea in the trench, you can see the hand of God. The glory of God is revealed in nature. From the heights of the Rockies, the deepest part of the canyons. The stars are God's fingerprints. The sun is a mere smidgen of his radiance. The moon reminds us that God doesn't sleep at night. The vastness of space reveals his infinite wisdom and glory. While the sand of pebble, or a pebble of sand, indicates his thoroughness. 
with the smallest and minutest of details. The glory of God is displayed all around us. The trees, the animals, the power of the bear, the height of the flight of an eagle, the care of a mouse, and even the function of an earthworm all declare the glory of God. The heavens declare Verse number four, the Bible says, their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them have he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit under the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. We look around and this morning, I want to walk before church this morning and enjoying, enjoying the time alone and enjoying time in prayer and worship enjoying nature and all of nature screams listen to the God of the universe all of nature declares there is a God of the universe it declares the glory of God we wonder sometimes when people who don't know God look at all of this and how can they come away with this thought this is an accident we see the smallest of functions in our body and realize there's a master designer and his name is Jehovah. We see the intricacy of an eyeball and we know that there is a master creator and his name is Jesus. In January of 2022, an underwater mapping project found a brand new, sprawling, two-mile-long coral reef that resembled a bed of roses. Remarkably well-preserved and pristine, it's the largest reef ever discovered at its depth. One scientist, not a believer, says this was like a dream. And my friends, we know the one who interprets the dreams. We know the one who has created the dreams. His name is Jehovah. His name is God. And the heavens declare the glory of God. There's a hymn that sometimes we sing at First Baptist Church and has been sung for ages. The name of the hymn is, This is My Father's World. Beautiful words, the stanza goes, This is, is my Father's world. And to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. Written by Malty B. Babcock. He was a pastor. The pastor in the northeast uh, part of the United States. And his tradition, his practice was to take a morning walk. In his morning walk, he had a full view of Lake Ontario. It was said before he left almost every morning, he said, I'm going out now. I'm going out to see my father's world. My friend, I don't know about you, but this is my father's world. And he did a really good job. This song points us to the glory of God in nature. And it is massive. It is powerful. It ought to move us. But then the psalm shifts gears. After we are stunned by creation, after we are captivated by the mountaintops and the, the depths of the sea and the beautiful creation and the, and the skies and the sunsets and the birds, verse number 7, we see that there's another aspect of God's glory that's been revealed to us. Look please in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring for, uh, forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Verses 7 through 10. We have the realization that not only has the glory of God been revealed in nature, the glory of God has been revealed in his word. And here the psalmist takes a slight shift and, and David begins to rejoice, not now in nature, but in what God has given to his people. And understand that at this point, David didn't have all that we have. And yet David says, everything that God has put down for us, everything that God has given, it is good 
I put into two categories here from this passage of Scripture. Number one, it is beneficial. We see the description of the Word of God. Here are the words used in Scripture. It says it is perfect. That means it is without blemish, full of integrity and complete. The Bible says that God's statutes, His Word, it is sure. That means it is established and that it establishes. Not only is it foundational, but it will bring foundation to your life and to my life. It brings assurance. There is the word used, it is right. That does not mean in this context correct, though it is correct. It means that is straight and true. Sometimes they'll say we've trued this board, meaning the board is now uh, exactly straight and it is even and parallel. God's word is not crooked. God's word is not duplicitous, duplicitous in nature. God's word is true, and it'll guide you in a true and a straight way. Maybe perhaps you've tried to level something then with a level that's not true, that's not straight. You say, oh, that doesn't look right, because your standard was wrong. The Bible has never misled anybody. It is straight. It is right. The word the Bible uses here, it is pure meaning it is the choicest of options. A few weeks back, we went to eat a steakhouse. I think it was Texas Roadhouse that has steaks in a cabinet. You can go to the cabinet, and you can choose a steak that you want. And like everyone does, I'm sure when they choose a steak, you're looking for the best steak you can possibly lay your eyes on. You want the choicest option. You look inside, I don't want that one. I don't want that one. I want that one. Sometimes at Jack's Meat Market, I'll buy steak there, and they'll have the full display and and I've made the guy dig all the way to the bottom which one do you want that one 17 layers down he's stacking meat over 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 this one nope nope Uh that's the one I want David here the psalmist says the glory of God is revealed in his word and this is the choicest of options if I have two options I get to choose the word of God Not only is it pure, it is clean. This word has a context, the idea it is clean in a physical sense. It is clean in a ceremonial sense. Israelites would have understood to clean would have been in a ceremony, in a sacrifice to be clean and to to be cleansed. They would have understood that that God's word is clean. It is clean in in a physical, in a ceremonial, and in a moral sense. And then the Bible said it's true and righteous. It is trustworthy and helpful. My friends, the the glory of God is revealed in nature, and in nature we see the handiwork of God. But in the Bible we see the character of God. We see his glory revealed in his character, in his characteristics, in his abilities. In the Bible, the glory of God is revealed in his names. It's revealed in his actions. It's revealed in his promises. Not only is it beneficial, it's desirable. The psalmist says here, more, I ought to desire the word of God more than gold. Well, we could stop right there and be challenged for the night, could we not? Do we desire God's word more than gold? We might desire it along with gold, with wealth, but do we desire it more than gold? If someone said, listen, you can have your Bible or all the wealth in the world, what would you choose? I know what you tell me you choose, and what I'd say I choose, of course, I'd choose the Bible. What if they said you'd have the Bible or you'd have no money at all? Not all the wealth, you wouldn't have any wealth at all. Would you choose, still choose the Bible? And the psalmist says it's more desirable than wealth, and it's more desirable than the sweetest dainty treats, honey in the honeycomb. The Gideons network of people who distribute the Bibles, and many of you have seen a Gideon Bible. One point early on in their time, we're distributing Bibles at that time in the former Soviet, uh, the former Soviet Union in Russia. They were permitted there, and they came to a certain village, and they had permission to pass out New Testaments at an elementary school. The police chief, as a story that I found or that I read uh, w- went on, the police chief accompanied them and was going to lead them to this elementary school. They had some knowledge of the area, and they were a little bit nervous when they realized they were going a different direction than they knew the school to be. 
They went about six or seven kilometers, and the road's not very good, and the traveling not very fast. Every kilometer passing, their nerves getting more and more anxious and a little concerned, but still trusting whatever was going to go on. They ended up pulling it to a different elementary school. They got out and passed out the Bibles, kind of confused and wondering what was going on. And they got done, and one of the leaders, of, or the leader of the group, asked the chief of police, he said, why did you bring us to this school? I thought we were going to this, he named this other school they were supposed to be at. Police, the police chief said this, he said, I brought you to this school. He said, because my two children go to this school. And I wanted to be sure that my two children got a Bible today. Some have said in familiar observation that the Bible is the best-selling book of all time. How many have heard that before? But it's true. But I found this note, guess to be true, but they say what's more startling than that, more startling than the Bible being the best-selling book is the fact that the Bible is still the best-selling book every year. It's amazing, isn't it? God's word points out to his glory and points us to the glory of God. But I want to direct our attention just briefly tonight to the end of this chapter. It's the point, it's the the point that that kind of caught me off guard a little bit as I studied this chapter. Because I see the glory of God revealed in nature, and I see the glory of God revealed in his word. But tonight I want to challenge us quickly tonight with this thought. Is the glory of God revealed in me? Is the glory of God revealed in you? And let's see now where the psalmist goes. He's just expounded upon nature. He's just been been so powerful with Scripture. And then he says this in verse number 11. Moreover. So kind of like to put these thoughts together. Moreover, by them, this is the word of God, is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The last few verses, the last verses of this chapter, the psalmist turns his gaze inward. He says, I see your glory out here. I read your glory right here, but I want your glory to to be displayed right here. He has a desire for cleansing, a desire for safety, and a desire for approval. Someone said this, that most people talk cream and live off skim milk. They talk about the cream of the word of God and the glory of God, but... All they have is skid milk Christianity. Our lips utter spiritual sounding words and phrases and prayer and worship and conversation, giving the impression of this top grade spiritual cream. But the reality is that our life and what's consistently produced is just skid milk. Here in Psalm chapter 19, David says, God, you are full of glory. You display your glory. And God, I want your glory displayed right here. God, I want the outside and the inside to be in full agreement with your word. You see, sometimes our outside and our inside are in full agreement with our flesh. And we are synced up in our carnality. We are locked into our desires, our motivations, our decisions, and we're living life and we're consistent. We are genuine, but we are genuinely wrong. Sometimes our outside and inside are not in agreement. Sometimes we know what is right, and we just make a bad choice and another bad choice. And David, the psalmist, says that in here. He says, help me, keep me from these sins. All right, and and, and keep me back from presumptuous sins. God, I want my life on the outside and on the inside to be in full accordance, to be in full agreement with you. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. God's glory is displayed in me in three ways. 
Number one, God's glory is displayed in me as I adore him on the inside. When we adore God on the inside, this is something that only God knows. He and I know. Now, I can say that I adore God, I have affection toward God, but, but I could fool you, and you can fool me. You know what to say, I know what to say. And people always try to over-spiritualize their life, right? Well, I just don't, I just don't know what, what uh, God wants me to do. I, they'll use this phrase, I've prayed about it. And by saying that, they want you to cease all questioning of their decision. I mentioned this before, but I remember reading one time in a, an article where this lady said, well, God led me to divorce my husband. Someone else told me once, well, God leads me to stay home from church Wednesday nights. I'll tell you this, I, I don't know who that is, but it's not God. It's not God. And we, get, we bring glory to God when I adore him on the inside. This is my spirit. The meditation of my spirit. I want that to glorify God. He knows. He knows if I'm glorifying him. And my friend, you know what I know if I'm glorifying him? I know. I maybe can fool you, but I know. We adore him, that's on the inside. We praise him, that's on the outside. Oh, the book of Psalms is filled with the praises of God. In fact, the Bible tells us that if we don't praise him, the earth or the rocks will cry out. We praise him as we sing. We praise him as we give testimony. We praise him. That's with our mouth and our lips. We praise the Lord. We're not silent in that. We're loud. We're vocal. We're bold in that. But lastly, we praise him with our life as we serve him. I'd like to end with this thought. I love it when my kids are affectionate with me. They'll come up and they'll say, Dad, I love you so much. They'll give me a big hug, right? Johnny, James, Danielle. I love that affection. I also like it when they say nice things. Dad, you're the best dad in the world. Of course I am, kids. No doubt about that. I love when they say, man, Dad, Mom, thanks for everything. Thanks for so much. Makes me happy. As it would any parent. Wife, husband, parent, a child, we like that. But understand that I am also pleased when my children live a life like we've tried to teach them to live. Now, can I say it this way? I am also glorified, if I can use that word, when they do the things I've instructed them to do, when they live a life of integrity, when they do the simple things, like are kind to their siblings, when I can walk in the room or in another room and I hear them share and, and be kind, I, I'm like, wow, you know what? Maybe I'm not the deadbeat dad. I am, quote, glorified in that. When they turn an assignment at school, when, they, when you hear from someone else, boy, they, they, they said this, there was maybe uh, some, some discipline in their life, and they, and they showed some character, integrity, they showed some humility, they showed some honesty. When they complete their chores well, all these things glorify Dreen and I as parents. And if I can, turn our attention that when we live a life pleasing to God, it brings glory to Him. This is why the psalmist says, keep me back from these sins. I want to be in full agreement with you uh, in my spirit, in my mouth, but in my life. And we bring glory to God when we serve him faithfully. It would be so duplicit for my children to say, Dad, you're the best dad. Mom, you're the best mom. I love you so much. Thank you. And then go sock their sister in the face. And go be selfish and lie and be proud then as a parent, I'd say, man, you know what? What you're saying doesn't ring true. It's hollow. What you're saying doesn't match up with your life. What you're saying doesn't mean much because it seems to only be lip service. And here the psalmist says, I don't want just lip service. I want lip service, but not just lip service. And God's glory here is revealed in, his, in the nature. God's glory is revealed in his word. But my friend, God's glory can be revealed in our lives as we serve him faithfully in our responsibilities. 
You know, when you work a life of integrity, you can glorify God. As you live a life of honesty and integrity and, and line up with the, with the attributes that God describes to us, you bring glory to God. As you display the characteristics and the instruction he gives to us, you bring glory to God. You bring glory to God as you give sacrificially for his blessings. I can use my children again. Sometimes they're selfish. We all have that nature, do we not? Not just the children. It's J.D. as well, and it's you. You put your name there. And there have been times when they've been selfish with each other that I've interjected myself in the conversation. And I'll say something like this. Now, you can do that, but do you want me and Mom to treat you the same way? It's a fair question, is it not? If you want us to be stingy with our resources, we can be stingy. That means you're finding your own ride to school and to soccer. You're buying your own clothes, soccer cleats, lunches. I mean, if you want stinginess, we can show you stinginess. Christians, we have so many blessings. Why are we stingy with God when he has done so much? We glorify God in this. Can a man rob God? How have you robbed God? In being stingy. We glorify God as we give sacrificially. We glorify God as we serve him faithfully. We glorify God as we forgive others like we've been forgiven. David here pleads for forgiveness. Keep me back from these sins. I want to be right. Jesus in the New Testament instructs us to forgive like we've been forgiven. And he says if we don't forgive, there's going to be an issue there. We bring glory to God when we forgive offenses. And my friends, offenses will come. They'll come tonight. They'll come tomorrow. We glorify God as we seek him first in our decisions, motivations, and desires. So at the outside and the inside are unified in accordance with nature. So the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. In the word of God, that's revealed so clearly to us. And in the life of the believer. The challenge tonight is your life on full display of the glory of God. Are you glorifying God not just in your adoration? Not just in lip service, but in a life that points everyone else to his glory. Jesus said that, says it this way, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The psalm writer says this, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable not to my spouse, not to my parents, not to the pastor, not to a friend, but God, let what's here in my life be acceptable in thy sight. It says, God, you're my strength and my redeemer. God's glory is on full display, but it is on full display in your life. Thank you.